Hello and welcome to the Vine Life Podcast. I'm Tony Clark, your host. Today I've got the honor of having Rick Florian on the program. And Rick, I believe it's spelled R R I S C K, I think, but we'll get yeah, into that in just a little bit. So Rick is a singer, he's a musician, he's a songwriter, he's a producer. He's most known and best known for being the lead singer of the rock band Whiteheart since about 1986. Now, Whiteheart is considered one of the premier bands, one of the best premier bands to ever play contemporary Christian music with many number one hits and albums. The band was inducted into the Christian Music Hall of Fame in 2010. And I, I love this in the words of Rick himself. He says about his time in Whiteheart, he ran around like a freak and sang really high. So, Rick, without further ado, ado thank you so much for coming on the program today. You're, you're very welcome. And yeah, so, that, so, that is one uh, of my few concise moments where I said that. Yes. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. Uh, short and concise, but but uh, that's pretty cool. So, so Rick, I'd love to hear about roads to where people are today. And your road to Whiteheart, it's an interesting story. And I recently found out that you didn't have a lot of musical influence growing up, such as like Led Zeppelin or the Beatles or things like that that you, you weren't really exposed to that type of music. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, we, uh, I grew up in rural Indiana um, on a little 10 acre tract mini farm. And we were the tiny lot compared to all the many hundreds or thousands of acres of cows and corn that were all around us. Went to a little rural school growing up. Um, you know, the things that occupied us were, getting locked out of the house so that uh, mom wouldn't let us in until the end of the day. Uh, that didn't always happen, but it happened. It happened literally like you kids go out there and play. And then, you know, she'd throw some water while we had the hose outside anyway, but um, you know, just messing around, you just figuring out what to do for fun, you know, climbing trees, all that stereotypical stuff, messing around the barn, going down to fish at the Creek, riding bikes and all that kind of stuff. So thankful I had the opportunity to grow up that way. But um, music was not a uh, significant part of our life. We didn't listen to the radio in the car. We didn't listen to music at home. Maybe at Christmas time, uh, Mitch Miller and the gang Christmas would get thrown on or the Mormon Tabernacle Choir or something like that, but rarely. Just music, singing at church in the country church where we grew up, that was really the only uh, influence musically. And, um, you know, and as you get older there, you know, start palling around with friends in high school and stuff, and you get to hear some stuff going on. Um, and I sang in choir at church and, uh, I'm sorry, I sang in choir at school. And, um, so there was some, like, I remember that there was, I know now it was a Beatles song. I didn't know at the time we did like a kind of a cheesy version of a high school choir singing a Beatles song. And gosh, I can't even remember what it is now. But, you know, a buddy of mine, Dave Fenstermacher, uh, my best friend, he had uh, invited me over to his house to listen to some uh, records that he had. And the very first one I ever heard was Dan Fogelberg Netherlands album. Wow. And to this day, it is, it's still to me one of the most beautiful albums I've ever heard. Um, yeah, both musically and lyrically. Um, it, it's, it's just wonderful. He's such a talented artist. And um, the first artist that year that I ever saw, Larry Norman, uh, was at Notre Dame Athletic and Convocation Center, and I saw him there. And it was so interesting, both uh, Larry Norman and Fogelberg died uh, several years back, about six months apart. And it, I don't know why, but it just caught my historic attention that here were these two, the first person I saw live, the first pers album I ever heard. And I think they both had prostate cancer that they died of. And uh, it was real just kind of a melancholy in a way, but there's still a smile uh, thinking about the origin of listening to music. And after listening to some stuff at Dave's house, you know, I did that proverbial 13 cents 
13 pennies, sending it out to, uh, oh gosh, Columbia House, and kind of the rest is history. I got Fleetwood Mac Rumors in Boston, and gosh, what else did I get? Uh, Eagles, um, ELO. Uh, I can't remember all the 13 for sure, but it. I, I was very, oh, Sticks. Um, and that was that was actually some of the vocal influence, even um, Dennis DeYoung from them. Um, and how I I just naturally I think a lot of people might I don't know try to mimic that person that's singing, and uh, that's just just sang my lungs out in my car uh, over time, you know, listening to stuff and. That, that's really my influence growing up is a uh, hodgepodge of stuff. Yeah. And, and I'm going to interrupt your road to, to white heart here for just a second, but, but Rick, what is it about the, I'm thinking back the the late sixties, the early seventies, the singer songwriters, those bands, like the singers, like, uh, and talent, like Dan Fogelberg, ELO mm. sticks, and, and it could go on and on. But what is it about that era that made the music so great and so unique? And we don't hear that today. What, what's what's the deal there? Well, I, I try not to be too crotchety old guy when it comes to music. <laughs> and that, whether that's mainstream music or whether it's, uh, you know, I, I still have uh, some PTSD, is that what they call it, with uh, – Christian music on some level, but the, yeah. cause I love it, but I don't love it, but it, it, that, that would be like 15 podcasts on that. But the, there's anything for me that has melody and, and, and melody, you know, you can fit chords and melody together, but what, what makes the music melody feel like poetry? And I'm not some guy into poetry deeply or anything, but there's something about melody and marrying that with lyrics and, and then whatever the combination of those are created from, is it a, a story of hurt? Is it a story of joy? Is it, a story of questions, what, whatever those things are kind of created. Um, it, it is when those marry so well, um, it, it, it just, you know, Mark Gersma, one of the guys in the band always said like, you know, God made art inherently attractive and whether that's a painting mm -hmm. on the wall or whether it's, you know, a song and a melody. And so what do you do with it? How do, what do you, um, you know, not everybody can paint and not everybody can write, not everybody can sing or play. And, um, and there's just different levels of it. So when we hear like somebody play a violin in a way that is just amazing, we're drawn to it. We're, we're drawn to yeah. it. And, and I just think that's something that God built into creation. There's still a broken part of it, this side of Eden and this side of heaven, that we just kind of uh, have to live within. But it's like working those things out. Um, it, it's just, you know, because when I think of like some of the melodies of the Eagles and stuff like that, it, it, it's, um, they're such talented guys. But that's what a lot of the Whiteheart guys grew up listening to, whether it was Zeppelin or whether it was, um, you know, Fogelberg or somebody. And it, it is a, you take that experience that you've had and that becomes a part of, you know, what you create. Um, and, and so I remember when, you know, because I came into the band after it started, it was it had already started, and a lot of those guys when they were playing, they first got together as backup singers and players for the Bill Gaither Trio back when Bill and Gloria had their heyday, 
and they're playing like 15,000 seat arenas and stuff. And when, and, and Bill was kind of a worked everybody hard. So they played and after they're done, then they sold merch, <laughs> merchandise stuff <laughs> like, Hey, buy buy CDs or, or uh, they didn't have CDs back then, but, uh, buy LPs and all that kind of thing. And that was like in probably 80, 82 when they were gigging like that. And what they do when they're all done, then they get on the tour bus and they start writing songs musically that they liked, you know, in the <laughs> vein of that, you know, pop and rock stuff they grew up in. And what was funny is when, and Steve Green, uh, amazing singer. And actually we went to church together for over 20 years. He recently moved to, uh, George would be by some grandkids, but Steve hmm. was the first singer in the lead singer in the band. And if you ever hear him on that first album, like he's got a pop voice on steroids. It's just, you don't think wow. of Steve that way. Cause he is big AC, uh, you know, like a male Sandy Patty kind of thing. And he hmm. was just amazing. And so when you hear that stuff, if you put that first Whiteheart album on, from that era of about 1981 or two and nobody's just, here's a new band, listen to them. And that's what I was in college. And a buddy mm. of mine gave it to me. I'm like, Holy cow. And, um, and then realizing that these guys were Christians and they were, you know, singing about the relationship with Jesus and what their faith does to their daily lives and all that kind of thing. It was, uh, I loved it. Uh, it was kind of in the vein. They got compared to Toto a lot because Toto mm. and Whiteheart has historically had tons of studio players who play for other artists and produce other artists. And um, Dan Huff, who's goodness gracious, you know, has produced and worked with Rascal Flats and you name it, tons of other artists. And um, so, yeah, the I was so thankful, like when I say that, that, quick phrase of, you know, I could sing high and I ran around like a goofball. That was kind of my job. The other guys were pros and I never knew how good I had it. Cause I'd never, other than my senior year at Taylor, we had a little band thing we threw together and, uh, did a couple things on campus. But other than that, you know, I never, uh, played in front of humans until, you know, had the chance with Whiteheart because I was on the road crew actually for them before I sang for them, which was another bizarre set of circumstances. Yeah. And you were, you were a roadie for Whiteheart and that's how you got the gig, right? As they were looking yeah, for a singer. Had, <clears throat> uh -huh, a buddy of mine, Jeff Moore, who was a Christian artist back in the day. Uh, we went to college together. That's actually how I first heard of Whiteheart. Um, and they had, let's see. I was on, that was in 85. I was on the road crew. I was just fish, finishing up driving a truck for Smitty back in 85 on the Friends Tour. They are playing sheds around the U.S. I was driving their straight truck, and that was ending. On the same day that ended, uh, I started uh, with Whiteheart on their road crew, setting up, you know, it was like stage manager with another guy setting up keyboard rigs and guitar stuff and front trestle lights and things like that. And, um, you know, one thing led to another when their lead singer had to leave. And that was a long story in and of itself. They, uh, when they decided they were going to continue, they didn't even know if they're going to continue, but when they did, um, they held auditions and I thought, you know, Hey, I'll audition, you know, the guys know me and they'll just let me audition and it would be awesome. So I did not really thinking that I would have any, you know, this little country church choir kid having a shot at doing that, that uh, they asked me a couple of weeks later to audition with the second group of guys. And then a couple of weeks after that with the third group of guys. And then they asked me to sing on a weekend of shows to see how it went. And then the rest is history, as they say. Now, um, and I, I, I'm assuming you, you've got such a, a great, unique voice uh it's clear beautiful high range you, you can do it all plus your stage presence 
is amazing. Uh, looking back through some of those old concerts, uh, you, you know, your stage presence is, is awesome there. Now, did you not know that you had this gift when you were, I mean, certainly you knew that you could sing, but I, I guess that yeah. the band recognized your talent at that point. And they said, Hey, we've got our guy. Is that, is that well, how it worked or kind of, you know, the I'm squirrely. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit, the more amped I get, the more out of control I can get. And so just in a one, one little side story was when I, when we get done set and stage and it was time for them to uh, tune the room, they'd call it, um, put in some white noise for a while in the front of house guys getting stuff ready in the, in the, in the hall or wherever we're playing. And, uh, it, back in that time, they, they had a, they, he would have a song, whatever sonically felt like the, a thing that had the dynamics and stuff to which he could, after they white noise the room, then he wants to put it on, see what it's tuned like. And, um, for EQing and things. And it was, um, Oh, every time you go away, that Canadian artist, gosh, what was this? That one, was that Corey Hart? I can't remember. Anyway, uh, he would put that on and start playing it. And so I was, by that time, I was usually done doing my gig up there and we're just like hanging around till they did sound check. And so I would grab the mic and start lip syncing the song. It was a beautiful song. And, uh, and I'd move around the stage just, you know. I don't know. I just did it because I wanted to do it. And when I heard, because as music became a big part of my life, it it penetrated me and became part of me when I'm listening to it. And so when you're on a literal stage in which people perform uh, and you're up there, you, well, somebody like me, <laughs> you know, some people are shy and there are points of me that can be shy or nervous, but when I'm not feeling that way, then I'm a bit animated, we'll just say. And so later, one of the guys in the band said, you know, because they didn't know that I could sing. And they go, man, if that guy could ever sing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just because I was always comfortable on stage and then evolved into doing back handsprings and just all kinds of just crazy wow. stuff that that just becomes a part of your, um, you know, I just love my favorite part was connecting with the audience. There was nothing mm -hmm. that I liked more in what we did than connecting with the audience. And so that's the eye contact, uh, body language. Um, there are things that there are times that might be on purpose, but then there are times where, you know, there's just literally there's a spiritual element to it. There's just a heart element, relational thing. Like we're all here for the same reasons. And I am trying to push myself out there with them. Um, and, and in that connection, if you ever think about how when somebody's on a stage, they're usually, you know, three to six, seven feet higher than anybody in the audience. And we're looking down mm -hmm. to them awesome, often. And so part of my job I felt like that I enjoyed was connecting that separation. Um, and sometimes I would dive in the audience, but sometimes <laughs> it was just, there's something about this relational thing that you can do with your eyes, with your body yeah. that will try to say to everyone, we are here for the same yeah. reason and let's do this thing. It would just, yeah. I loved doing that. Loved it. So, Rick, uh, thinking back to some of the great albums that you guys did, like Freedom Powerhouse, Inside, I'm curious as a musician, when you think back to those albums, do you, those time, those eras of time, do you think about recording the album? Do you think about the tours? Do you think the, about the places that you saw during those time periods? I'm just curious, when, when, you, when you hear Freedom, for example, uh, that album, do you think about the recording it or do you think about being on tour or both yeah. of those? Yeah, there's probably no album that I think more about the recording of it than Freedom. Um, probably half of our albums were recorded at a place in downtown Franklin called the Bennett House. It's an old antebellum mansion, and um, it got converted into a studio. And so when you're cutting live, 
like Chris McHugh, our, our drummer and my roommate back in the day. Um, and like, he's played for Keith Urban over 10 years. And like these guys, again, it just amazes me. I got to, I'm thankful I got to play with them. His, you know, arms, the size of my thighs. So, you know, the only guy I've seen break graphite sticks and, you know, he, he just, uh, he's, yeah, he's strong, uh, weak in no way. He was, uh, we'd set him out in the, there's a bay window thing out front, uh, and you're modifying these these houses into and this tall ceiling, so there's a lot of ambience for the you know the rock element of what we did. Um, but we'd always want to cut live. We wouldn't keep most things. We're we like, but I'd be in the room, and Gordon would be in there, and and Tommy, like everybody was in there. Uh, Gersh sometimes, yes, uh, on keys. But we're all got headphones on so we can isolate. And uh, but, you know, they'll have like several amps upstairs uh, that are live mic. So there there's just a lot. The creativity, the of of just that in getting sounds of uh, and then finding ways to inter intersect and interact with each other and then where uh, first studio that, well, not the first, but video, uh, using a lot of video to communicate with the control room and the players and stuff out in the house um, because they were in a different part of the of the property. And so doing that kind of thing, um, the that's why cutting live is so... Uh, it feeds things that you can't get when guys are just emailing, you know, stuff to each other. Hey, I need a keyboard overdub. Here's, here's what we got. Here's the rough or here's the whatever. And it comes back and there's financially, you got to do that a lot. You just can't afford to do it the way we did back then. But you know, if we might spend at least 150 K recording an album back in the day and hardly nobody spends that much now. Um, even, mm -hmm. A, double A artists. Um, some of it's because they have their own studios and stuff to, to pull that kind of thing off. But so, you know, instead of renting studios. But um, I remember that about Freedom, even as much as like that song Power Tools, where we're rolling an aerosol can against the old hardwood floors, running along that can with a microphone. Uh, when you hear is that, it, what that is? Is that that sound? At the very beat, well, it's multiple sounds. There's also a squeaky door that we're swinging back and forth, back and forth. You'll hear, work it, work it, work it. Yeah. And, and here's a yeah. flop, 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 flop. <clears throat> and then trying to get some of that to work uh, at the tempo that we're creating. And uh, just because some of it was crazy stuff and fun, and some of it was, you know, the the other more musical elements of it that uh, I just love cutting live together, uh, the energy, um, and 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 that's where the paint is getting on the canvas. You're putting it mm -hmm. down. You you've had all these sketches or drawings or ideas. We would usually rent a rehearsal hall for two weeks before we went in the studio, so we had time to evolve the songs live play them live play them live wow. and and creating no that we need you know we need another couple bars on this section or we need to take out a couple bars on that section uh you know that riff you had right there that's kind of haunting in the background that is awesome don't forget that you know you if you don't do that stuff playing together live for a while then what ends up happening is you do it on the road after you created your album. And then you're going, man, I wish we would have got that on tape when we did it. Um, so anyway, like I said, I ramble. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I, I just, I, I love to see the process of, of 
um, camaraderie between individuals who make something greater than themselves, whether it's a, making a movie, a TV show. Uh, I think VH1 used to have a show years ago called Behind the Music. Yeah. And it kind of gave yeah. the, the genesis of great albums, how they came together and the, the personalities, how they conflicted and how they oh, got yeah. together to, to make something better than. I love, I love stuff like that. So I love hearing behind the scenes, Rick, of how you guys put these things together. And, you know, if someone were, doesn't know about Whiteheart, out of all of your huge discography, I guess that's the correct word, your, yeah. your discs, your, your albums, right? Yeah, looking, looking back, yeah. where would you encourage them to start? You mean if they're wanting to play and sing, basically? No, if they're just l wanting to listen to Whiteheart, oh. the, the great the great musicianship that you guys had, your your great voice, would you uh, encourage them to start at Freedom, or how would you encourage them to get started with Whiteheart? Well, some of it might depend on what draws them to listen to music, because um, there are some of the like studio heads, the liner note readers, as we would say back in the day, like some guys when they got an album – as they're putting it on, the first thing they're doing is finding who all the players are on all the songs, who are the writers on the songs and that kind of thing. Uh, most people don't care about that kind of thing, and especially the way people consume music now where it's songs. It's just individual songs. We don't – like when we put a 10-song album together, we didn't just randomly throw those songs on there. We – it was a whole tapestry of stuff that we put together that had purpose from our perspective, that it was mm. meant to be listened to in that order. And yeah. uh, sometimes that it would follow dynamics of intensity of sometimes combinations of lyrics or melody that um, would cast a broad view of a story. Almost it, in each album might be a little more story like than others. Uh, but you know, I, the thing about the Freedom album, um, and there's a lot to like, it's like Brian Wooten, who was on Powerhouse and others, you know, he's been playing for Trace Atkins, I think, for like 15 years. You know, Tommy Sims, the only time that Bruce Springsteen didn't use the E Street Band, it was Tommy Sims on bass. You know, it, Gordon wow. is out, he was out with, he's been out with Frampton on and off for like, almost 20 years now, but he's out with Garth Brooks right now. And so it's like all of these guys have played with so many other artists and written for so many, like that hit that uh, changed the world, uh, that Clapton cut. Um, it was a number one song. Gordon, Tommy, and Wayne Kirkpatrick wrote that. And mm. it, there's just so much talent that was in that band that I just – was thankful to ride the coattails along the way. So back on your original question of listening to, you know, there's something, if people want early 80s, like pop, then go listen to the first Whiteheart album because Steve Green's voice is amazing. And Dan Huff sings some lead on some of that as well. And Dan Huff, like guitar player, you know, he moved to L.A. for a while, and he and Lukather from Toto were the two main guys that everybody used for albums. You know, wow. Christopher Cross or, you know, Madonna and Michael Jackson and stuff out there at that time. It's like just when I think through the history of the band, uh, you know, I'm just a guy with a biology degree that I've never used and uh, who's a real estate agent now. You know, I just got to be with those boys and – and thankful for and thankful that I'm still good friends with some of them. You know, Gordon and I probably and Gersh are the ones that pal around the most. Uh, we were just Gordon did a little uh, fundraiser for Ukrainian uh, some folks that are uh, missionaries that are going back there. And uh, he and uh, we we're just sitting in the audience. Um, you know, there is nobody if anybody's listening and you want to have a storyteller come and play hit songs they've written, call Gordon Kennedy and have him come. There, There is nobody better at storytelling and then rolling into playing songs with him and his guitar. It is, I will pay to go, but I don't have to because he's my friend. <laughs>
Yeah, if, if you'd like, you can give me the link to um, to him, and we can put that below the video. And if, if anyone's interested, they could certainly get that contact there. Oh, I would I, I will uh, do it when we're done. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Rick, you know, and, and I, I want to talk about your real estate career here, and we'll go into that. But you mentioned some of the great players that you guys had in the band and, and the amazing talent all across the board. When I listen, and I don't mean to be negative here, but I guess I am, but when I listen to Christian music today, I, I don't hear the White Hearts. I don't hear the, it, it seems like it's a, a formulaic, almost every song kind of sounds the same. There's no, there's no taking chances like you guys did and others of your genre. Where is that today? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be even handed because there is that old crotchety guy and be like, yeah, music's lame now. And it was great back then. And, um, because everywhere it's somewhere, everywhere it is somewhere in the music realm. And it just may be it, nobody wants it. And because, and, and this is, this was always a big challenge, even back in our day, that's our living. So I have to get paid for it if I'm going to keep the lights on. And so we'd have people sometimes say, well, you should come for free. This is a ministry. So we shouldn't have to pay. And, you know, I kind of, on the thickness of onion sheet, I understand that thought. But in the same sense, when you work, do you work for nothing? And so, the, you know, there's this battle of m mission or ministry and livelihood. And so with, with that kind of thing, you might not be the sound that's quite happening or you don't have quite the look or you don't quite have the communication skills. And because I promise you right now, there's some music and gifted singers or players out there that will just never be heard much. And, and it's sad on some level. But and there is formulaic. There was some formulaic back in the day. Back in the day, it wasn't white heart because we couldn't even get on the radio hardly because we we're too rowdy. So, yeah, it, it is. And now we could. But, you know, like uh, there's a guy, Ed Cash and and Ed, and he knows how to write to make a living, but he's incredibly talented. And um, was it we the uh, that's so funny, I forget the name of it. We the kingdom. Is that it? Um, I don't even know if you've heard of them. But Sounds familiar. He's Sounds a, familiar. well, they've had some, uh, they're, it's in the realm of worship-oriented, worship music, as some will say. Um, but there's some elements of that, and his daughter sings, and his uh, brother, and then some other players, and his son. There's some pieces of that that I really like, but I only happen upon it because they go to our church. And so, it, but they're usually on the road now that COVID's loosened up. But, um, and they're very, very popular right now. But they're, yeah, I know the formula thing is, and radio programming, it, you know, if you think of the word programming, you know, because I'll even tell you back in the day for the things that if you think, man, it all just sounds the same, it all just sounds the same. Well, back in the day, we're playing out in L.A. at one of these, like, Six Flags parks for a kind of festival they had. And um, I won't mention the radio station, but you know the name. And back then, we're in a green room and tons of people just coming and going because all kinds of artists are there. And he said out of his mouth, not knowing that there's creative artists right in front of him. He knows we're there, but he doesn't understand what he's saying because he said, you know what? You know, if a guitar solo gets longer than seven seconds, we will not play it on the radio station because all of our uh, surveys we've done have found that the 39-year-old female, which is our target audience, will turn the, the channel if a, a guitar solo is longer than seven seconds. And wow. there wasn't anything from a creative person's mind that could have been more grotesque sounding. You know, it was like, you're kidding me. Like that's how you actually figure out what you're going to play on the uh, on your radio station is you know at minimum at least we got to start with no eight second guitar solos or longer. 
And so there was formula back then. There's formula now. And but I I do know that whatever kind of genre ish broad view that is hitting hitting the high stuff that people want to hear, everybody's going to try to create that because yeah. that's the best potential livelihood. And so that's where for the, that there's always going to be this battle either within yourself as an artist or with the people that handle you. Hey, can you make one a bit like, and this is always gross sounding. Can you do one like blah, blah just did write one like blah. that. Just like, because they want, because that's what's hitting, and so they want more of that. And, you know, so there's always that kind of underbelly of the business side of stuff that's gross. But, you know, it, it, that's all, there's that tussle will always be there because if you want to do music for a living, which means you get paid for it, which means you that's how you eat, sometimes you might actually compromise, you know, some of your – you know, I remember record labels pushing us, eh, can you give me now the tweaked version for radio of that? Like, that one's seven minutes long. We can't do that. <laughs> we need yeah, – yeah. that would be great radio if you could make that three minutes and 50 seconds. But anyway. Well, it's it's amazing that you guys were able to, to – pursue what you love to do and they weren't the the cut off versions of of songs so I, I i certainly appreciate that about you guys now rick uh coming to the late 90s uh you went into another career of real estate how, how did you go from being a rock star to real estate and uh, forgive me i'm not sure if it's I, I i always get this confused realtor or real estate agent and correct they're me on both, that I'm they're not sure both which. things um you can be a real estate agent and not be a realtor uh, and the, the designation for Realtor is a, uh, frankly, a higher level um, uh, code of ethics you have to abide by. So you can be a real estate agent but you and not be a Realtor. But to be a Realtor, you would have to be a licensed real estate agent. Um, gotcha. So I always say there were 18 reasons I quit doing music. And I can't name them all. I don't even know what they are. It was just there was enough things that were happening in the industry. I had uh, a personal situation where my wife wanted to leave. Um, all though, th those were two of the biggest things, but there was just, there was other things too that were um, taking up life bandwidth that um, I didn't, I didn't have to have music. I saw often people that would rather die than not do music that um, wouldn't know what they would do if they didn't do music. And I think part of my growing up not having music in my life allowed me to know that I can be happy not doing music. You know, where if if from your adolescence on that it was like consuming you um i know some people that just won't quit and they actually should have 10 years ago <laughs> and it, it is and it doesn't make a bad person or anything it's just you know there's just a time and a season for everything and so mine when i started okay if i'm not going to do music i looked at doing solo stuff and it just felt like I was trying to make it happen rather than it was naturally, I got to go do this thing. And well, biology degree that I had, I wanted to do marine biology, but now I got three kids and, you know, relational, you know, craziness. Like I couldn't afford to go do that. I, I need, um, I need some because I'd have to start out at like, like I'm a 22 year old out of college and I couldn't afford to do that for the jobs. And I would have had to go back to school more. And it just, I didn't know what I was going to do. Well, I'd always enjoyed real estate and the agent we used to, I loved her and how she worked. It was always intriguing. And my entire life had been self employed. And so that's a self employed life. Oh, you know what? While, while I'm still, finishing up my, you know, uh, 
music career. I had a publishing draw from writing, and um, we were on Curb Records at the time with Mike Curb, wonderful guy. And um, by the time that was, I, you know, I started doing real estate part time. Um, and when we were doing the last album um, with Curb, I, I said, you know what, I can quit now or we can keep doing this, but I'm not going to tour that album. I'm going to be done. And I was thinking about it, even the album before that. Um, well, I guess would that have been inside? I guess my little brain can't hold all the info, but I think the, so. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the only one we actually were nominated for a Grammy ever. But the, when I went to the, um, to the place of, okay, I'm going to start this shift and see if this is a thing. And I love the freedom of being able to do it whenever I wanted. And as one thing led to another where I started building my business in real estate, because when you first start out, it's people's, lar most people's largest investment they'll ever have. And so the thought of them, you know, long hair, hippie freak, yeah, man, I can help you buy your house, dude, I'm awesome. Um, it's like I didn't have, for one, I didn't have the experience yet. And so it is a slow walk building business and real estate. So because so much of it is trust. Do you trust this person to care for you uh, that they're going to look out for you? And then do they have enough experience that they can do it? They can take care of you. And, you know, I had mentor that helped uh, – my first year or two, which was incredibly wonderful. She was awesome. Um, and learning, she was patient. She could multitask like a monster. And you just learn how to do the business side of it. But over time is, you know, and I built my business and it is, I still tell people this day, I'm so thankful after having a spoiled brat job of music to be able to do something that I love and enjoy. I really do. When I love the hunt, I love like taking care of people. I love making sure that, you know, that there might be something about the house that they love, but I know it's something that can be a problem that I've done it now 27 years full time. And so I've, I've learned quite a lot and like I can tell over half the time if you got a load bearing wall in that house and I built the little house next to me for my in-laws. And so I have more construction experience now and just the ability to understand a market and what to look for. And I still am more of a talker than a listener, but the listening part I've gotten better at. Um, yeah. Cause that's really important to hear what people's needs are and then try to fit that, you know, in their affordability range and make it happen. I just, I love it. I love it. So you, you're in the, you're in the Franklin, Tennessee area. Now with your real, um, with your real estate business, do you cover this broad area? Is there like a county oh, yeah. that you cover or counties? How does that work? Yeah. Counties. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, cause I live in Franklin. Um, Franklin is, is in a county, Williamson County, um, south, directly south of Davidson County, which is Nashville. So tourism, middle Tennessee is enormous. Um, it is a very, um, business friendly state. The, we get corporations every month virtually that are relocating to middle Tennessee because of the, we don't have state income tax. People like coming here yeah. for that. Um, we don't have a state tax. We're one of only nine states in the United States that don't have income tax or a state tax. So when people are thinking of retiring, this is a place that they look for. We, we get two inches of snow a year, you know, so we have the seasons, which I love, but it's, you're not having to worry about shoveling, you know? And so some people who are thinking of retiring come here because I love, we get more rain than Seattle, but we have more sun. Because when Seattle rains, it just, you know, sprinkles. When we rain, we rain, but then we're sunny. It's rain or sun. And um, 
I love, we're so green. The wildlife is huge. We have hills and parks and like creation is alive here. It is awesome. Mm -hmm. That's one of the best parts of living here. So we're, we're such a heavy relocation company. Uh, and there's so many more people moving here than we're top five almost all the time. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. we are also right now top five lowest inventory metro areas in the United States. Uh, what, what does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean, Rick? Oh, I'm sorry. Inventory. Yeah, a little techno on you. The We don't have houses. In, instead of having like, you know, somebody looking at 10 houses to buy, it's almost like we have 10 people looking at one house to buy. Wow. It, it is, our inventory is so incredibly low and we're one of the worst in the country. It's been driving our prices crazy. Like the, for years, Williamson County, the one south of Davidson, Nashville, has been around the 12th wealthiest county in the United States. Like you can pick some East Virginia, Silicon Valley counties and, and uh, in California. And then Will Williamson County, Tennessee shows up. It's so bizarre. Part of it's for good or for bad. We have very, almost no poverty in the county. Um, best schools in the state, you know, those kind of factors that a lot of people in real estate look for and very low crime and all that kind of stuff. So it is when we're, when people are looking for places to reload, this is where they come. And, but the problem is that just when you already have low inventory, it's been driving the houses crazy. The average price of a house in Franklin now is about 800,000. It's, it's just, wow. it's crazy. I hate it. None of us like it. Um, it, it is, uh, in Brentwood, the town north of us is over a million dollars now. It's, it's nutso. So when you say, do I work pretty much here? Well, the affordability of an average human in the United States, they can't afford $800,000 out. I couldn't, if, but I bought my house over 20 years ago. So that's why I can live here. Yeah. So it is, so we have to go somewhere else for somebody who's got three, 400 to spend. And we do run into this issue because Nashville's average price now is probably about 440, 450. And so you have to go further out. But even if you go further out, you know, if I go like 45 minutes south of Nashville, like through Williamson County to the next county, Murray County, you know, a three bedroom, two bath, 2,000 square foot house is probably going to run about 400,000, you know, I need it, to move my house there. <laughs> well, yeah, I ever been to the number physically move my house to that area. Yeah. And, and where I grew up, my 2000 square foot ranch house with a almost 2000 square foot basement on 10 acres with a big pole barn and chicken coop and fenced and everything, you know, that's probably about 280,000 right now up there. And that same 10 acres down here, 10 minutes out of Franklin would probably be, uh, I don't know, at least $2 million, you know, wow. it might be two and a half. It, it's just, it's idiotic. And, but I can't do anything about it. And on some level, maybe I'm part of the problem because I'm helping people buy houses, but, and they just can't build houses fast enough. Um, I mean, I, I love where I live. But I just wish a few more normal people could afford to live here. Um, it's it's very affluent, which is not always the best place to be. Rick, if if someone's looking to sell their house or buy buy a house, hopefully in that area that you that you um, do your real estate in, mm -hmm. um, how would they contact you? Oh, just rickflorian dot com. They can just pull up, you know, Google me. <laughs> if my number six, one, five, three, four, seven, one, nine, five, one, you know, back in the day, we didn't let people have our numbers, but now I got to let people yeah. have our numbers. And I still get calls of like, I don't really have a real estate question, but man, I loved your band back in the day, which is, <laughs> and it's, I, I'm thankful. I, I'm thankful. Yeah. It means they're old, <laughs> yeah. but, it, yeah. it, no. but it, it, I'm thankful, but yeah, they could do a quick Google and find my, you know, email and phone number, website and stuff real easily. 
and, uh, and below the video, I'll put the, the link to your website as well. So if, if someone's in that area, you know, they're looking for real estate or looking to sell their house, like, I'll encourage them to get in, in contact with you uh, to you. do those things. Uh, Rick, uh, I, I've got to ask this. Uh, you, a, a few years ago, you did a Morse Fest with uh, Jesus Christ, the Exorcist. And I, I, the question I'm going to ask, it almost sounds sacrilegious, but <laughs> or, or you, you did an what? amazing job playing the devil. You did an amazing <laughs> job in the live yeah, performance well, playing the devil, also in the recorded version. Can you tell me, how did that come about? Well, this side of heaven, we're all broken, you know, so there's uh, a little of it is, uh, that's not true, uh, scripturally that there's a little bit in all of us but the uh you know we're all broken and so the idea of this this buddy of mine have had known for over 20 years mark hollingsworth uh worked for compassion international for many many years but before that he managed petra and other uh different bands incredibly sharp guy uh incredibly compassionate guy actually he's he uh, politically, and I love it, he leans kind of liberal. Um, but the way that he leans liberal is he's angry that the church doesn't help poor people as much as we are able. And so I'm like, you know what, Mark? You're right. You're right. The church does not uh, help uh, the poor as well as we are literally able to. And so anyway, Mark and I, maybe once or twice a year, we just have lunch, check in how each other's doing, and uh, he had texted me a while back, uh, like prog rock, his nickname, progressive rock stuff. Um, that guy had not, I, I never listened to that kind of, that wasn't my thing. And uh, so Mark mentioned him to me and said, hey, he's doing this. He, he wrote this uh, extravaganza. And um, I thought maybe you could you know, do something on it. Why don't I hook you guys up, see if you can. And so met with him and, uh, and Schlitt was on it too. Uh, John and I have gone to church together over 20 years. So we've known each other for a long time. Oh, wow. And the, you know, so he was on it when they were looking for another guy I said, Hey, y'all just try John. And, um, and it reminds me how high I used to sing and how not high I can sing as much now or at least with stamina. And uh, it was, that character was pretty, like to do like a rock opera kind of thing, it's you're animated, right? You're acting too, kind of. Because uh, there are lines in the thing, uh, not for me really, I was just singing. But the way you sang was more Broadway, you know, uh, animated, which, you know, signed me up. Cause I'm just wired that way. And I loved doing that. Um, so it, it was, uh, you know, it's, you know, it, somebody's got to play him, right. <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. He, he's a part of the realm. So it, there's something about being able to play that kind of part or playing a comedic part. Those are the fun parts because mm -hmm. you, this character that's not really, um, you know, the straight guy, uh, when you get to be crazy or maniacal, that kind of thing is more interesting. It's more, uh, you can sink your teeth into it more. And, um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I'm just getting too old to, you know, and my voice to be able to, to do that kind of thing. I, I couldn't, I wouldn't want to do a tour anyway, but, um, it, it is, uh, it, it was very fun. It was very fun. A lot of talented guys. And again, that realm of music, the prog rock thing, you got these little shredder guys and, uh, cause it's not metal. It's not, uh, like it's not striper, you know, or something, but it, it's incredibly talented guys that are just, yeah. Man, they're moving. They're just moving. I wasn't real familiar with that kind of stuff at all. Um, and but it's got melody, and it's just moving. It is moving stuff. And uh, yeah, there, it was fun working with some of those. One guy from England was there, and yeah, it was fun. 
Well, you did a, a, an amazing job, and I, I encourage folks to look that up. Look at, at your performance; it, it's pretty amazing. And, and also, uh, you know, listen on the album as well. You're on there as well, uh, but your your voice is is, is crystal on, crystal clear on that. Uh, that those songs that you sing there, uh, and that's I, I appreciate like a, a Neil Morse. I appreciate a White Heart because all of you guys were at the top of your game, um, you know, musicianship and and creativity and and taking chances. I, I just I love to see that. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, uh, Rick, I I, I want to ask you. Uh, I'm sure there are some young artists out there, and you've been at the top of your game. Um, in terms of uh, the way that you sing, the way that you perform, uh, you've been the, the the professional guy out there. What advice would you have to young artists out there who have faith, who who are who are a Christian? They have a relationship with the Lord, but they want to be at the top of their game. Do you have any advice whatsoever as to how to uh, have some wisdom and discernment as they progress in their careers? I think kind of. Starting out, um, I'm trying to think if it was Mike, uh, a friend went to church to, with for years, Michael Card, um, who was a singer-songwriter back in the day. He had said to me, it's like, because when, when I had some of this interest in music and like, I don't know if I could ever do this kind of thing. And he's like, just do, just do music. If you feel like, God's calling you to do music, just do it because it could be that what he has for you is to play in front of those 20 kids in the youth group. And that is your musical call for you. Or it could be 20,000 people at an arena. You don't know. And, and the, so just obey, be obedient to whatever that call might be, but don't, let yourself think that that call is running fast as you can past those 20 youth group kids to the 20,000 arena people, because it's typically going to be coming from like a, I will feel better about myself as a human being. If I can have that level of success, it is a dangerous world, the entertainment industry. It, it is, you know, the world in general is inherently dangerous. But there is something about the attraction of art, like we mentioned earlier, that people are looking up from the audience at you and they're going, you're awesome, you're awesome, you're awesome. And that is incredibly dangerous. So if you don't remember every day that you're an idiot like me, then you're going to start believing your press clippings that I really am awesome, aren't I? Yes, I am. I am great. Come on. Uh, it, it is such a crazy thing to handle. It, it is more dangerous than most occupations it, for your heart. It is. It is. You just have to. You need to have people around you You need that will keep you grounded, that will tell you when you're being an arrogant idiot. And, um, and that's why even more being grounded in your faith is important. And, and that's whether you're, you know, singing songs that are about relationships with your wives or your friends, or it comes down to uh, that you want to do music for fellow believers. You know, um, it, you know, because you can write a love song about your wife that has no mention of Jesus, but that is something still within the realm of your faith. And so, just write and sing and play those things that prick your heart, that that you're drawn to, that that almost not consume you, but that bring you joy, that bring you frustration, those things that are passion in in the art of the music. So work at your craft, work at the ground level of writing a melody, uh, writing a guitar riff, you know, or piano, you know, and, you know, be your own best critic, uh, but find people that you know and trust who can tell you, 
what they think about it that have enough giftings in, in a craft world that can say, you know, that's fine, you know, but, you know, maybe, you know, I've heard that melody riff like 1,853 times. Maybe you can do something with that chord, though that chord, if you change that one chord to this minor chord now, you know, like Gordon is, you know, he's one of the most that I've ever met writers. Uh, he's incredible. He has a history of country music and the Beatles and in, in growing up. And because his dad, Jerry Kennedy, like when you hear pretty woman, pretty woman, walk, you know, down, 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 down. That's Gordon's dad. Gordon's dad was huge in the uh, music industry in Nashville, uh, you know, produced the Statlers and played and all kinds of stuff. So Gordon has country music roots in him, but he grew up listening to the Beatles and loves them. So his stuff has Beatlesque flavors. And and I would even say to this day, one of my top uh, 10 favorite albums of all time is one that none of you out there have heard. And it's called Mosaic. And Gordon and this other guy wrote all of it for Ricky Skaggs. And they recorded it, gosh, I don't know, five to ten years ago. It is not a bluegrass album. And it was a stretch for Ricky to do it. But uh, Ricky, who is a bluegrass and top shelf ever guy, very, very talented, but a man of faith. And the lyrics on that album to this day just a third of them make me ball if I hear them. It it, it goes back to the Fogelberg album. <sighs> yeah. Powerful. Yeah. It, it is. It, it's most most music is fun. And, but there are times where the, when the connection of the music and the lyrics are so profound, it is, it's, it's what music is supposed to be. Yeah. And, uh, like that album is just, it, just listen to it. Listen to that album and yeah, I can't stand it. And they're, they're talking, they're working on some stuff. They'll probably do another Mosaic 2 album. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that album did hardly nothing. And part of it's because the guys who, Ricky's folks don't know what to do with the thing because it's not bluegrass. And, the Christian music thing doesn't want to do because it doesn't fit their mold. And then yeah. I don't care because, but it should sell 10 million because the heart that's in that thing is just stupid. It is unfreaking believable. It, it, oh, the, the gospel is, is just, you know, like a Borg from Star Trek coming in. It's yeah. just, it marries everything together in such a beautiful way. I can't stand it. It's just, and Gordon, again, the storyteller that he is, is like when he tells, you know, stories about where the songs came from and, oh, I just, I love it. I can't stand it. So buy Mosaic, Ricky Skaggs, and um, you won't be sad. You won't be sad at all. Well, the, the way that music um, has touched you, I, you know, and, and I'll just conclude with this, Rick. Um, looking at some of your old music from Whiteheart, I read comment after comment after comment of lives that have been changed. God has used that music or that song to touch someone in, 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 mm -hmm. a, in an amazing way. And, and I'm just reading some of the comments. I'm just paraphrasing. But, you know, it's like God helped me through this difficult time I was going through back in 1992 or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but you could tell the, 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 the folks that were typing these things out, that's an old word there, they were using their keyboard to, to express their feelings. Um, God used the Whiteheart music 
to change their lives or to, to better their lives or to get their focus back off of themselves and back on to Christ. And I read many, com- typically I don't use read comments, but I read these comments and lives, hearts have been touched because of the music that you guys produced. Mm. And the way that that, that that album touched you that you just spoke about, that's the same way that folks' lives were being changed because of White Heart music. So I just wanted to, I know you know this, but I just wanted to encourage you with that. Thank you. You know, it still amazes me. And, and a lot of it is we got to try to get out of the way when we're doing our thing. Um, because anything that's going to have eternal value, it's going to be coming from him anyway. I am not going to, you know, it's it's not, yeah, we're physically up there and we're singing, we're playing or whatever, but it's just, you know, that whole idea of one beggar telling another where to get bread, you know, and that is, yeah, those stories still, it, 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 in spite of us, God did wonderful things, you know, because every one of us is just, you know, kicking that can down the road and looking around on, uh, on the path we're walking. And it just like, there's no better times in my life where I have hope when I have him present right in front of me. And, but it takes a lot of work and that's why the walk is daily. You know, it doesn't just happen and then it just rolls out. It is a work, you know, cause this world's broken. So it takes work to keep talking to him every day in the midst of our neutral times, low times and high times, all of those. And feeling our need of him, understanding the focus of we need him. And if we don't feel a need of him, we're not in the right place. We're, we're running our own show. You know? Words of wisdom. Uh, very good wisdom, actually. So what's on, um, and thank you for that, Rick. That's 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 what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's on Rick Florian's schedule? What, what do you got? What do you got planned? Do you have music planned? Do you have, are you basically just uh, raising your family? Well, um, yeah, there's, well, there's a lot of that. And uh, yeah, I got five kids and then I got four grandkids and, um, you know, one's still in the house. Well, on one and a half because the college girl's back. But uh, we do... Well, COVID kicked it, kicked it away for a while, but in our backyard in mid October, we'll do this little, it's not even really, it's, it's a loose fundraiser, but, um, but we just play pop cover stuff in our backyard. We set up stage and then I make this gumbo for a hundred people and anybody wants to come can come, uh, you know, we don't lock the gate or nothing. So, uh, you just anybody can come and we we'll, what we usually do is we'll have a singer songwriter play for about 45 minutes and then um and then we'll come up for about 45 and just play cover stuff it might be an eagle song might be you know logan's song or you know just whatever we'll we'll play you know i don't know about 10 12 songs just because my wife loves you know music and she loved our band back in the day and so um we just do that in the backyard so that's that's one that's the one thing we usually do we've been doing about six seven years in a row except for covid when we couldn't do it um so if anybody listening is uh in the area i think what was she saying maybe october 9th we usually do it on a saturday night um we can't go late because we're in a little one acre lot subdivision and want our neighbors to not be too disturbed. Um, <laughs> and just a bunch of friends would get up on stage and hang out, eat gumbo and play. It, it, the light fundraiser it is, is um, we, if people want to put uh, money in a hat, we'll, we pick somebody every year who is a caregiver for someone who is ill, not the ill person, but the caregiver, because um, my wife's best friend died of cancer years ago and her and another friend that you just found out how draining it was to try to do your own life and then help this person. And so we get money put in a hat so that we can maybe get them a weekend away because you can hire 
somebody else to watch the person who needs the care, something like yeah. that. And so we call it guitars and gumbo and uh, just do that in the backyard uh, usually every year until my voice eventually gets to the point where it can't do stuff. Like I can't yeah. really sing white art stuff anymore. Uh, maybe one song. <clears throat> so I pick songs now that are not quite so in the sky, you know, uh, that's just how I roll now. <laughs> so, so basically you you can still run around like a freak though. You just can't quite yeah, sing quite as high. Is that what big. you're saying? I've heard, I've heard all my friends. Uh, so, uh, my knee's always moving that that's the one thing, whether I'm singing a, an old hymn at church or whether I'm singing, you know, peaceful, easy feeling. I, my knee is always going to be moving. It's in my DNA, but yeah. the running part, uh, I don't run like I used to. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So uh, Rick Florian, is there anything else you want to add uh, to maybe some of your fans to tell some of your fans something or uh, uh, have you said it all? Uh, I pretty much said it all just, you know, you know, life is short. Love your family. Love your God who made you. And, you know, that's what we're here for. Yeah. And Rick, I'm going to ask you to stay on for just a couple of minutes after the conclusion of the um, uh, the broadcast. But Rick Florian, thank you so much for being kind and coming on today and, and talking to us. Happy to, man. And until next time.